so this is my workbench. It's pretty unstable, it's pretty janky, but it's gotten the job done. And this pile of wood is going to be my new workbench. I think after about two years of woodworking, it's time I had a proper woodworker's workbench. Hey everyone, my name is Ryan and welcome to another installment of my Building a Workshop series. I'm really excited about this episode because I've been wanting to build a sturdy workbench for a while, but never felt like I had the tools necessary until now. So I started this project by breaking down these large 2x12s. If you're looking for cheapish wood for a workbench like this, go look at the wider 2x10s or 2x12s at the big box store. The wider boards means they had been cut from a larger tree, which means you're more likely to find clean boards with no knots. I was able to find two very clean boards that were able to yield me all the pieces I needed to make my bench legs, long aprons, and long stretchers. The first board gave me six of the eight pieces I needed to make the legs. And to get these components cut and squared, I used a hybrid combination of hand tools and power tools. I began by cutting the large board to the rough length of the legs, which was easy enough to do with my hand saw. Then I used my hand plan to get a somewhat square edge on one of the edges. I could then use that edge as a reference to lay out the final width of the leg piece. Then using my circular saw and a guide, which is way easier than rip cutting these pieces by hand, I could cut the board just past my layout line. Then using my hand plane, I could plane the board down to my layout line and bring the board to its final width. Then it was simply a matter of repeating this process six more times until I had six boards that were all roughly the same width. For the next board, I cut it in half, and that gave me the length I needed for my long stretchers and aprons but also two remaining pieces I needed to make the final workbench leg. I repeated the same process of squaring one inch, using my circular saw to rip the board to rough size, and then planning each board down to its final width. Because the aprons and stretchers weren't going to get laminated together, I could take the time at this point to flatten one face and square one edge. This whole milling process was a lot of work and probably took around a week or two of working a couple hours each day, but eventually I had four aprons and stretchers halfway milled and eight pieces roughly milled for my workbench legs. Speaking of the workbench legs, in order to get the size I wanted, I need to laminate two pieces together to give me three inch thick legs. And once the glue was dry, I could knock off the larger glue pieces and then use my winding sticks and hand plane to flatten and get any twist out of one face. Then I could square one edge to my recently flattened face. In a power tool shop, this step would get accomplished by a jointer, but since I don't have a jointer yet, I had to rely on my trusty plane for this step of the milling process. Finally, I could then use my planer to finish the milling process. Since the legs needed to be the same thickness and width, I could take each board and run it through once on the recently flattened face, and then run it through again on the squared edge for each of the four legs, just the thickness of the plane, and repeat the same process until I got the legs to the final thickness I wanted. I then could repeat the same process for the aprons and stretchers. Normally you'd use a table saw to cut your pieces of the final thickness, but since I didn't need my pieces to be super precise, and since they were thick enough to run on their edge, I just ran all the pieces through at the same time to get them all to a uniform size. I could then move on to cutting out all my pieces to the correct length. To do this, I lined up each leg and grabbed the shortest leg. Then I laid out a square line across all four sides and used my crosscut saw to cut off a majority of the waste. Then using my plane, I could square off the end to get a nice finish. I repeated the same process for the other end, then used the first leg as my reference for the remaining legs. This meant the next board I could square one end, line it up with the reference leg, and mark the end so it would be exactly the same length as my reference leg. Then, I repeat the same process of cutting off the bulk of the waist with a saw and finishing squaring off the end with my hand plane until I had two legs exactly the same length. Then I repeated this whole process for the aprons and stretchers, getting one piece squared and to length first, and then using that as a reference for cutting the rest to the same size. Since these were thinner than the legs, I used a square block and a sharp chisel to cut each piece to the final length instead of using my hand plane like I did for the legs. This process took quite a while, but eventually I had four legs and four aprons and stretchers finished and ready for joinery work. And speaking of joinery, I next moved on to cutting out 16 mortises that will be used to assemble the workbench base. I tried something new by laying out blue tape so I could more easily see the mortise need to be cut, and I have to say I really enjoyed it. it. made it very clear where the mortise was and where I needed to cut. To make the process a little quicker, I decided to draw out most of the waste with my drill press set up in a way where I could quickly work through each mortise. 
I set up a fence with a spacer that let me drill down one side of the mortise, and then I could remove the spacer and drill down the next side of the mortise until I was left with the bulk of the mortise removed. I repeated this 15 more times and then used my chisel to remove the remaining material. I worked pretty quickly and didn't take too much care to ensure each mortise was perfect because you wouldn't end up being able to see the mortise once everything was assembled. Once the mortises were cut and before moving on to cutting the tenons, I began the process of assembling the solid workbench top. When all is said and done, the workbench top is about 3 inches thick and 2 feet wide. The top is made up of 16 2x4s, and there's no way I was going to use my hand plane to knock the rounded corners off of each, nor did I want to take the time to run all 16 boards through my planer to get the rounded corners off. So instead, I decided I would glue the top together in three sections that would each be able to fit through my planer. Then I could take each section and run it through the planer until one side had all the rounded bits removed. The problem with this is that a planer doesn't remove any humps or twists in a board like a jointer would. So after the planer did the bulk of the work of removing the rounded bits, I then needed to use my hand plane and winding sticks to get rid of any twists and bumps. Then, since I wanted each section to come together seamlessly, I needed to square each edge to my newly flattened face. Once I flattened each section, I could then run the other side of each section through the planer. I set the planer to cut one thickness, ran each section through at the same setting, adjusted the cutting thickness, ran each section through again, and continued this process until all the rounded bits on the other side were removed. By running each section through at the same thickness, this meant at the end of the process, not only were the rounded bits removed, but then each section was cut to the same thickness. Once all that was done, I could then glue each section together. This whole process didn't really leave me with a perfectly seamless top, and there are some gaps here and there, but at the end of the day, this is a workbench top that is going to get beat up, marked up, and whatever else done to it, so I didn't mind that it wasn't a perfect lamination. Once the glue had dried, I could then use my apron as a straight edge to check for any bumps and begin the process of flattening the top. To flatten the top, I needed to get any high spots cut away first. In order to do this, I cut an angle across the length of the bench, first one way and then the other. I kept alternating my cuts until I could hear the plane cutting all the way across. Once I could hear it cutting all the way across, I then knew that the bench was flat across the width. Once that was done, I now had a flat bench across the width, but most likely had twists along the length. So using my aprons as winding sticks, I could check to see where there was any twist, and then use my hand plane to cut away the high spots. Once I was satisfied that the top was relatively flat, I could then set my plane to a very thin shaving and make a final pass along the entire length to get the top nice and smooth. Finally, I used my panel saw to cut the top length and square off the ends. If you're wondering if this was tiring work, let me assure you that it was indeed exhausting. But it was also kind of fun in its own way and it gave me an opportunity to use my great grandfather's saw which was pretty cool. Now the cane observer may have noticed that I only cut 4 aprons and stretchers before and that I was missing 4 shorter aprons and stretchers. Well, this is because I wanted the bench top to be flush with the base and I didn't know how wide the bench top would end up being. So as a result, I waited until the bench top was finished, which allowed me to place the legs on the bench and ensure I was getting the right length for the shorter aprons and stretchers. Once I had this length, I could then find some offcuts of 2x4s I had lying around the shop and go through the whole process I did at the beginning of squaring an edge and face, running each board through the planer, cutting each piece of the length, and squaring off the ends until I had my final four remaining aprons and stretchers. Now traditionally, you'd use a marking gauge to set the shoulder line of each tenon from one end of the board. But I knew my ends were not perfectly square, so instead of referencing from the end of the board, I lined up all four pieces together and marked the shoulder line of each from the same reference edge. This ensured that the length from tenon shoulder to tenon shoulder would be the same length, which is ultimately what matters most. With the tenons laid out, it was simply a matter of using my saw in combination with my chisel to cut away the waste. Once again, I didn't put too much care into worrying about getting these exact, since these are ultimately blind tenons that won't be seen anyway. The most important part was getting the shoulders cut square so that they would seat flush with the bench legs. Then to keep track of each mortise and tenon, I marked each with Roman numerals using my chisel. Once the short sides were finished, I followed the same exact process for the longer sides. Out of the entire build, cutting these mortise and tenons were by far my favorite part. I don't know what it is about cutting joinery by hand, but I find it to be such a rewarding process.
Once all my tenons were cut, and with the tenon knot in place, I drilled a hole through the mortise. Then I could assemble the tenon, and using the drill bit, I could transfer the hole location onto the tenon by pressing down on the drill bit. Then I could take the tenon back out, and instead of drilling directly where the drill bit mark was, I could offset the hole slightly towards the tenon shoulder. This creates what is called a draw bore mortise and tenon. By offsetting the hole on the tenon, when I hammer the peg in, it will cause the tenon to get cinched up tight to the mortise. Not only does this help make the joint a tighter fit, but the peg will ensure that the tenon stays in place. With all that done, I could then assemble the short sides of the base first. Now I probably should have used larger pegs than the quarter inch dowel I am using. I'm not sure how much these draw bores actually did anything because I probably didn't offset the hole in the tenon enough, but I still think they look cool and were fun to hammer in. Once everything dried, I could then cut off the pegs and flush everything up. I then repeated the same process for the longer sides of drilling out the draw bore holds, gluing the entire base together, hammering in more pegs, and cleaning everything up once I had it all dried. Then it was time to attach the top to the base. I decided to attach the top using L brackets for two reasons. First is quick and easy, and second, I imagine I'll be moving in the near future and want the ability to be able to easily disassemble the workbench to more manageable parts. I also plan to fill the base with drawers and may need to take the top off to install drawers, so having the ability to easily remove the top is a plus. Once I was done, the final step was to flip the bench over, which was no small feat, and then install my new quick release EOS device. As I'm installing the vise, I want to take a second to explain why I chose this workbench design. The first thing I wanted in my workbench was a solid wood top. I've gotten used to having a large work surface, so I knew I didn't want a tool well, and I also knew I wanted the weight that comes with a laminated top. The next thing I knew I wanted was an open base that I could fill with lots of drawers. I'm desperately in need of storage space in my shop, and tired of having odds and ends scattered about. So I'm excited to be able to have drawers right at my workbench to bring organization to the chaos of my shop. Plus, the drawers will add further weight and rigidity to my bench. I also chose to make the top flush with the base because this will allow me to put dog holes through the legs and front aprons, which will allow me to support any long boards I might need to plane. Lastly, I chose a face vise primarily because it is what I'm used to, plus it is pretty inexpensive. And quite honestly, in the last few years, I've been woodworking. I've never felt like I needed anything else. I guess it's one of those things, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of situations. So those are some of the design decisions behind the bench. If you have any further questions, please don't hesitate to leave a comment below. Anyway, once the vise was installed and fitted, I added a light coat of tried and true finish, mostly just for the color, and then it was time to tear down the old bench. It was kind of weird and kind of sad to take down my existing bench. And now that the new one is in, I kind of miss the old one. I'm sure I'll get used to the new bench eventually, but there was something about the thrown together nature of my old bench that I kind of miss. Speaking of which, if you're watching this and thinking about getting into woodworking or building a workbench, my advice to you would be to throw together whatever you have lying around your garage or workshop to give yourself a space to start working. Something I enjoyed about my first bench was that it helped me see what I wanted or needed in the workbench. From using the first bench, it helped me see that I really only needed a face vise and tail vise for work holding. Or it also helped me see that I enjoyed a large work surface to lay my tools and other things on. Ultimately, if there's anything to take away from seeing this old bench taken down, I hope it would be that you don't need any fancy woodworking bench to get started in woodworking. Just go out into your shop, throw together whatever you have, and start making things. And so, once I had taken down my old bench, I could maneuver the new one in place, step back, and enjoy my hard work. So thanks for watching, and subscribe if you don't want to miss the next video where I'll fill in this whole thing with drawers.